Hello, and welcome to the Century One family. In this onboarding video, we will discuss the following items. We will cover the Century One architecture. We will explore the Century One client. We will go over some basic troubleshooting steps utilizing Century One. And finally, we will take a look at some of the options you have for alerting and configuration. Let's begin by discussing the Century One architecture. Century One has a three part architecture made up of the Century One database, monitoring service, and the Century One client. The Century One database stores all the data that is collected from your monitored servers. The monitoring service collects the data from your monitored servers and writes the data back to the Century One database. Finally, the client connects to the Century One database and pulls back the collected data to display for your use. You can have as many Century One monitoring services and clients in your environment as you would like. You are only limited to the amount of monitored instances you have purchased licenses for. Let's now take a look at each of the panes within the Century One client. The Navigator pane is a tree view pane located on the left side of the client by default, and it's divided into two sections. The top section allows you to drill into the various levels of the hierarchy within your monitored environment. From here, you can do things such as open the event calendar or launch performance analysis for each of your monitored targets. The bottom section contains customized event calendars, event chains, and configuration settings. The event view is used when you are looking at the event calendar. This view allows you to filter the calendar and only view the events that you are concerned with. Plan history is used when you are working with Plan Explorer that is integrated into the Century One platform. This will display any additional estimated or actual plans that were created during a specific session in Plan Explorer. You can view more information about Plan Explorer at this URL. By default, the Conditions and Settings panes are located on the right side of the client. The Conditions pane is used to configure actions in response to the monitored conditions when these conditions have evaluated to a true state. The Settings pane is where settings are configured. Some of these settings include the maximum runtime threshold and settings to control fragmentation manager collection and behavior. Maintenance windows that differ from the global setting can be set here as well. Both the conditions and settings panes work on the principle of inheritance and are dependent on the object that is selected within the hierarchy in the navigator pane. Now let's talk about how to navigate through time and jump between Century One solutions and the tabs within these solutions to help us troubleshoot performance issues. Using the toolbar at the top of the client, we can set a start and end date and click on the go icon. This will bring us to a point in history where we can view the data that were collected during that time. We can also select the sync option on the toolbar. This will allow us to jump from tab to tab within the solution so that the data displayed in each of these tabs will reflect the time frame that we have selected. Right clicking on the charts will allow us to use the jump to option to quickly switch between the solutions and tabs within the Century One platform. Let's now take a look at the tabs available within the Century One Performance Analysis solution. We will start with the Performance Analysis dashboard. On the left side of the dashboard, you are presented with the Windows metrics for your monitored server, and on the right side, you are presented with the SQL Server metrics for your monitored instance. If you are running in limited access mode, you will only be able to view the instance level metrics. In the Processes tab, you are presented with a list of processes that are running on your server, as well as metrics related to the resource utilization of these processes. The Disk Activity tab displays information about the data and log files on your server. This tab also displays the latency for reads and writes from those files on your disk, as well as the latency from the system to the disk controllers. The Disk Space tab displays information on the size of the files that reside on your disks, the free space that the disks may have, and a forecast of when you may exhaust the space on these disks. The Disk Space tab also provides more detailed information about your data and log files, such as auto growth settings and number of VLFs. The Top SQL tab will display any potentially problematic queries and procedures that run on your instance. Top SQL also provides you with a look at the execution plan diagrams, as well as a history of the queries and procedures that have been captured by Sentry1. The Indexes tab provides a view of the collected table and index information according to the settings and schedules that you choose when enabling our Fragmentation Manager solution. The Always On tab provides you with information about your configured availability groups. The Blocking SQL tab presents a view of the blocking events that were collected on your server. This view provides different versions of the block depending on what SPIDs were being blocked and which SPID was the head blocker at the time. 
The deadlocks tab provides a grid of the spids that owned a lock on a resource, as well as the spids that were waiting for that particular resource. The deadlocks tab also presents you with a graphical representation of the deadlock, which allows you to easily identify the steps that led to the deadlock. To get a holistic view of Sentry 1, we will now look at our event calendar solution. You can open the event calendar for your targets and instances globally or individually by right-clicking on the nodes within the navigator pane and selecting Open and then Event Calendar. When the calendar view opens up, you will see objects with glyphs next to them in different blocks of time. The glyphs represent what the objects are. Please note that the display corresponds to the date, time, and filters that you have applied in the toolbar. Within this calendar, you can drag and drop events that are scheduled to run in the future, and those events will automatically be rescheduled within SQL Server. You also can see where any failures or any conflicts have taken place that could have led to resource contention on the server. You can right-click on any of the events and use the Jump To Context menu to look at the history of the event or to jump over to various tabs within Performance Analysis to assist you when troubleshooting a performance issue on your server. At times, the calendar may become very cluttered with events, making it hard to find a specific object. For this reason, Sentry 1 has provided the ability to filter the objects that appear in the event calendar. You can do this by selecting View, then Event View from the menu, and selecting the tabs where you want to change the selected values. For instance, you can choose the Event Sources tab and select only Deadlocks to see only the deadlocks on the calendar. If this is a view that you would like to use in the future, you can select File, then Save View As to save this view as a custom event calendar. Another thing that the event calendar solution does is track the runtime for your monitored SQL Server agent jobs. This is particularly important when comparing runtimes for different instances, such as when a job run takes place after a cluster failover. The event calendar solution also includes the ability to set up event chains. Event chains consist of a series of SQL Server agent jobs or Windows scheduled tasks running on the same server or different servers. These are used to automate a series of events that need to follow a specific sequence. Finally, the Event Calendar solution allows condition and action pairs to be set for your monitored tasks and jobs, allowing you to receive alerts when runtime thresholds have been met or failures take place. Now that we understand the basic functionality that is available to us, let's take a look at one way to use Sentry 1 to troubleshoot a performance issue. Upon opening the client, the first thing we can see is that there is some unusually high activity in our CPU chart. When we investigate further, we can see that the increase in CPU utilization is mostly being driven by the SQL Server instance. So that I can get a better idea of what was running at the time on the SQL Server, I will highlight a spike in the CPU chart and select Jump To and then Top SQL. Within Top SQL, I will select the Completed Queries tab. Completed queries are queries that exceeded the threshold set within the top SQL source setting. The default threshold captures queries that run longer than 5 seconds. The Completed Queries tab will show you each individual query that was captured during this time. However, if you would like to group the like queries, you can do so by selecting the Show Totals button in the toolbar. For purposes of this demonstration, I will click on the Show Totals button once more to view the individual queries. Now I can begin to investigate the queries that ran during the time that the CPU spiked. To do this, we will want to click on the CPU percentage column. This will present us with a sorted view of the queries from the highest to lowest CPU usage. Please note that this value is calculated based on all of the completed queries that were collected at this time. Now that we may know the heavy hitters, we can check to see if there were any execution plans or statements collected for these queries. The checked boxes under the Has Plan and Has Statements columns will let us know if this is the case. If there was an execution plan collected, you can click on the completed query and the plan will be displayed in the plan diagram. You can investigate this execution plan further by opening the plan up using Plan Explorer. Next, we will cover our alerting and response system, which is one of the most important functions that Sentry1 provides for you. As we discussed previously, the Conditions pane is used to configure actions in response to the monitored conditions when these conditions have evaluated to a true state. For example, I wish to get an email when one of my jobs starts, so I will select the SQL Server Agent Job Started condition with the Send Email action from the Conditions list. I will then select Darth Vader to receive the alert in the Action Settings tab. I will change the importance to High, and I will leave the From address alone. Once I click away from the Conditions pane, these settings are automatically saved. 
I can further define the alert for the SQL Server agent job started condition by selecting New in the Condition Settings tab. I will then click on the plus symbol to add a new condition. From here, I will click on Owner and select Object Name instead of Begins With. I will click here and select Equals and then I will enter in the value for my job. Now I can select the Save button. At this point, instead of receiving an email for every job that starts, I will only receive an email for the job that is named Test. To go one step further, I can refine my condition by utilizing the Rule Set tab. The Rule Set tab allows you to define when an alert will be sent. The default for this is Notify Every Time. However, if I was to execute this test job every 30 seconds, it would generate a lot of email alerts. I can restrict this by clicking on the New button and fill in the information here. After providing a name for this rule set, I can select the type of rule set I want to apply if applicable to the specific condition. There are two types of rule sets that can be used within Sentry 1. They are the count-based rule sets and the time-based rule sets. The count-based rule sets allow you to specify how many times a condition must occur prior to receiving the alert. The time-based rule sets allow you to specify how much time the condition must remain true in order for an alert to be sent. In this case, the SQL Server Agent Job Started condition only allows a count-based rule set and will not allow a time-based rule set to be defined. I can select how many occurrences must take place prior to me being alerted in the Process Actions After section. In this case, I only want to get an alert after the first occurrence. I will uncheck the box next to Within 1 Hour and change the Process Subsequent Actions Every to alert every 5 additional occurrences. In the For Up To box, I will change this to 0 seconds to make sure that this continues perpetually and click the Save button. Once I click away from the Conditions pane, my settings are saved. Sentry 1 also allows you to set up advisory conditions at different levels of inheritance within your monitored environment. You can view the conditions that have been configured at these levels of inheritance by expanding the nodes in the navigator pane and double clicking on the conditions list underneath these nodes. Please note that the severity, number of occurrences, and age of the advisory condition events, as well as the number of servers that are being monitored in your environment, tie directly into the algorithm for the Environment Health Overview Score. The Environment Health Overview, or EHO, provides an at-a-glance health status for your monitored environment. You can find more information about the EHO at this URL. Finally, I will discuss the configuration options that are available to you within the Global Settings node in the Navigator pane. Once you open up the Global Settings, you will see five tabs along the left side of the page that pops up. These tabs are the Alerting, Storage, Forecasts, Privacy, and Advanced. The Alerting tab has settings for your SMTP server, SNMP configuration, a place to define a maintenance window for your Sentry 1 repository server, and configure an execution account for PowerShell. The Storage tab allows you to configure how many days you would like to keep your event history. This is the retention period for the data that is displayed in the event calendar. You can also set the retention period for your performance history. This is the data that is displayed in your Blocking SQL, Top SQL, and Deadlocks tabs within the Performance Analysis solution. You will also be able to set the retention for your Sentry 1 message history, which is the data that is displayed in the Actions log. Finally, you will be able to set the retention for the Index Usage History, which controls the retention of the Index Usage Statistics counter data. Hovering over these options will provide you with more information about these settings. The Forecast tab allows you to provide a schedule for when the disk forecasting will take place. There are two options for disk forecasting, Standard and Advanced. The standard option uses a standard linear regression algorithm, and the advanced option uses more sophisticated algorithms. More information about disk forecasting can be found here. The Privacy tab allows you to view the end user license agreement, as well as send telemetry data to Sentry 1 so that we can improve our solutions in the future. Finally, the Advanced tab provides you with the opportunity to change the polling interval thresholds, settings for when event chains are affected, how actions are fired in response to historical data, or triggering the SQL Server Agent job block condition. You can also enable the Always On Health collection, set the maximum text length for the query collection, and change the normalization engine from advanced to basic. More information on all of these global settings can be found here. Now that you know about some of the most important concepts involved in using Sentry 1, we would also like you to know that we are here for you every step of the way. 
If you have any questions about this information or you would like further assistance, please navigate to our support website at support.centuryone.com. Thanks for watching.